Excerpts from Maya Angelou's Phenomenal Woman Pretty woman wonder where my secret lies I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model's size But when I start to tell them They think I'm telling lies I say it's in the reach of my arms The span of my hips The stride of my step The curl of my lips I am a woman Phenomenally phenomenal woman That's me Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back. The sun of my smile. The ride of my breasts. The grace of my style. I am a woman. Phenomenally. Phenomenal woman. That's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout to jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. It's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need of my care. Because I am a woman. Phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. So Tembi, let's start with um, the fact that you grew up in Tata and then you went to high school in East London. Um, how is that? How do you think the Eastern Cape has shaped like, you know, a sense of who you are and, you know, where you are now in life? Um, okay, growing up in Tata was very strange for me because mm. I went to boarding school in grade two. So my entire childhood experience was very removed from the actual surrounding and the environment that is Imtata. Um, despite having grown up in places that could be regarded as, you know, uh, rural or whatever, that was always very far removed from my experience, um, which kind of caused me to be alienated from my own surroundings every mm. time I were to go home. And then moving to East London, same scenario, staying in boarding school in a more kind of white um, environment that also caused me to be further removed from my own natural surroundings. So every time I were to go home to Imtata, I'd feel almost alienated that it kind of caused a shift in my own perspective about myself growing up. I almost didn't feel like I belonged. Um, and like, what did you do with that sense of not belonging? Because people channel the energy into like different things. You know, what, yeah. what, what did you channel it into? I think um, East London really became home for me. And I used boarding school as kind of a platform to gain all those like strong relationships. So that's where most of my um, friendships that I have now have become sustained because that's where we forged our own community. We were interested in fashion, we were interested in um, blogging, we were interested in writing. We became our own kind of home and our own kind of family, so yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, speaking about like your different interests, so you've always been interested in things like, you know, art, reading, poetry, um, you know, fashion, etc. Um, why have you decided to move your brand more towards art um, and fashion? I think, um, Starting off, like if we speak from an Instagram or social media perspective, I was just using it for fun. Like I never thought, oh, this could be something constructive for me. And then it's only when I finished university and I went into um, the art world and the art curating stream where I realized that I can do something that's entirely disruptive with the social media. I don't have to be necessarily someone that um, promotes other people's brands, but I can promote my own business. I can use it to um, push forward my own event and I can basically create an entire e-commerce network just by my social media and bringing the art world forward to people who might not necessarily be exposed to it. And what do you think like brought that realization into mind? Because I mean, you, your following has grown, like if I'm not um, incorrect, on Instagram alone, you have like 116,000 followers. Yes. You know, how, what made you think, okay, well, I can actually make this into a business? Was it seeing other people? Mm. What was it? I think firstly, um, it was coming from a place of when I first started being popular on Instagram, it was purely from a point that sexualized me. So 
a lot of the followers I gained were through pictures that I would post um, wearing bikinis or like wearing like really provocative items. And for a moment, I enjoyed that kind of attention. But then I started to realize that this might not necessarily be how I want to perceive to be perceived because in our country you can only be one thing like you can't be a multifaceted person you can't be one day looking beautiful and sexy owning your sexuality and the next day you're an intellectual so then I started to trick my followers I started to be like okay if you're following me because you think I look sexy how about I start selling you art mm. how about I use that attention that you already have given me into another channel something that's going to benefit me so that's how I basically started to negotiate the whole social media thing with the followers that might not necessarily have followed me because of what I do right now, but I decided to use it to my own advantage. Um, and I mean, I'll first want to start with the curatorship before we move to the more, um, the you know, themes you've mentioned about people sexualizing you yes. and so forth. Um, but so let's start with the art. Um, in terms of being a curator now, like as far as I understand, you're an independent curator, although um, yes. as you said, you do work for certain galleries. Yes. Um, as far as um, I've read and sort of researched in the space, it's not as big in South Africa. Mm. So why are you so passionate about growing it in South Africa when you could, you know, be going um, overseas? and mm. like doing much better yeah so my first experience basically with independent curators mm. was when um, last year I was doing my honors in curatorship at UCT and they took us on a trip to Germany so essentially we were supposed to go to the um, Berlin Biennale that's an event that's hosted every two years in the art world mm. to basically celebrate art um, educate people about art and every year it's hosted by a different country sometimes it's in venice sometimes it's in brazil sometimes it's in berlin so we went to the one in berlin and for the first time a black woman her name is gabby Ngobo from south africa was curating the entire berlin biennale she does not work for a gallery she does not work for a museum she's absolutely independent um and she garnered a group of black curators from all over the world, Sao Paulo, um, America, anyone from the diaspora. She gathered all of them and she decided this was the project they were going to do. So from that experience, myself and some of my friends were really inspired where we thought we don't necessarily have to work for galleries. We don't have to work for museums. We can actually become a collective and do these exhibitions by ourselves. So that was the first thing. Mm. Then secondly, not wanting to go overseas and wanting to push it here was because there's a genuine lack and there's a genuine emptiness when it comes to black people in the art world. Like the diversity is almost no. Mm. So there was that passion inside my heart to want to push it forward and to want to be basically one of the first young black women who are in this space and who want to take up space deliberately. That's very powerful. Um, and with the artists that you do promote, I, I noticed that you you know also promote like a lot of African artists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's sort of your thinking in terms of strategy with combining you know um, high income earning clients who might not necessarily be African yes. and the African ones. You know, why yes. why that approach? Yeah. So right now, my project is to get people who don't collect art into the habit of collecting art. Okay. So my primary focus is usually particularly black middle class individuals who almost have no exposure to the art world but are interested in um, beginning to collect some kind of art. So as um, prejudice, prejudice or bias as it might seem, that is my particular project. So looking at the artists that I, I choose, it's always emerging artists who, some of them have been formally trained and mm -hmm. have gone to art school, some of them haven't, but it's always people that I see that have potential. So part of it is speaking to people about how investing in art um, can be beneficial. So mm -hmm. I pick these artists and I say, I, I have the eye for this. I've studied this. I, yeah. I know how to predict which artists are going to be successful in the near future and the ones that won't. Mm -hmm. So just by my word purely, I have such good support that people will come to this event and they will purchase artworks purely because I say, trust me, this person in the next 10 to 20 years, they will be so successful by the time you, you resell the artwork. 
it's going to be like extremely beneficial for you. Yeah. So that's the primary focus right now. But I can see that it's going to grow to a point where I'm able to handle people who are beginner collectors, people who are already in the collecting sphere and so on. So that's basically the trajectory I'm trying to take. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. And t talk to me about the art of dining, you know. Yes, yeah, so the art of dining, as I've mentioned with this project of targeting beginner collectors, mm -hmm. is a social platform where um, we invite people to a restaurant that we've partnered with. It's called Pantry and it's in Bryanston. And we essentially have 20 to 25 people because we want to keep it as intimate as possible. We have an artist of the month um, and that artist will have their work on show, the work is for sale, and then the chef at the restaurant curates the menu according to the artworks that are on sale. So it's a good mesh between food and art, okay. and it also basically gets the conversation going. It's nice to have the artist there to also explain their work, because yeah. a lot of people would be interested in why did you use that color, why do you use that contrast, or yeah. what is this medium, what, what is lithography, like things that people don't necessarily understand. So the artist will be there to speak about the process behind the work, I'm there to speak about the actual investing in art element and then after that we open it to the floor for questions and answers and then it's basically an experience for everyone to just view the art. A lot of the time people want to buy the art immediately yeah. so we also have facilities for that. Okay. We take a commission from the artist mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a good um, agreement between me and the artist. I give them a platform because of my strong social media following. Yeah. Um, the restaurant also has its own facilities where we get good food. They also have PR on their side and then the artist is merely there to promote themselves and their work. Okay, very interesting. Um, yeah. And in terms of further career prospects or you know things that you're looking into, because I know you also have an interest in food. Um, yes. Do you see yourself going into any of those spaces or you just sticking to this for now? So right now, I've literally made art my main focus. Okay, that's So good. I'm trying to infiltrate all aspects of it. So as far as, for instance, having my own gallery one day, that's mm -hmm. top on my list. Mm -hmm. um, as far as being one of the best art dealers in the country that's top on my list and then also being part of boards of several organizations because um, for instance a lot of banks are interested in the arts and they have their own um, collections so I'd love to be um, having a seat at those tables but as far as my involvement goes it has to be art focused yeah makes yeah. sense and then in terms of um like your entrepreneurship sort of sense and business acumen where do you think you get that from because a lot of young people are very afraid to go out on their own and do yes. what you're doing you know yes. you're speaking to like people who manage restaurants you know in convincing people in a market that's not tapped into mm. to believe in you in you yes. you know and that's for me a mark of an entrepreneur yes. so what do you where do you think you get that from i think growing up there wasn't um, many entrepreneurs in my family mm -hmm. most of the people were basically blue collar workers. Mm. So teachers, lawyers, doctors, I never really saw anyone running a successful business in my personal family. And then when I moved to Joburg, I literally got here with no plan. Mm. I had no job, I had no business, I had nothing going for me, but I knew that I'm coming to Joburg and I'm gonna make something for myself. So because of that desperation, I decided I'm not gonna sit here and wait for an opportunity. I'm going to create an opportunity for myself. And the thing about art curating is, it's one of those jobs where you can't, there is no um, blueprint. You have to create it for yourself. So as much as we understand that, yes, you can work in a gallery, you can work in a museum, there are several other things you can do outside of that. So for instance, working in non-gallery spaces like mm. restaurants, using social media to sell art. It's all things that I've never seen before, but yeah. I've decided, okay, this could be something that I could adapt into my own kind of way of running a business. Okay. So now it's all a matter of formalizing it. I registered my company. I have my own um, website. I have my own uh, infrastructure around this little idea that started as, I don't want to chill at home in Tata while I wait for a job. I want to come to Joburg. I want to hustle. I want to do what everybody tells me to do without the expectation that 
there's a certain way to do it. it makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's talk social media. I mean, you're very um, all about like, you know, being body positive, you know, embracing your body and so forth. Um, I remember seeing a post from you where you were talking about how you were smaller in a certain picture, but because of your mindset, you know, you felt like, you know, crazy or whatever. How do you think social media influences body positivity? I think right now we are in an age of body dysmorphia. Mm. Like a lot of the time, because of popular culture, reality shows, certain celebrities who make it okay for people to constantly be insecure about their bodies, we're living in an age where only one body type is acceptable. And it's the insta baddie kind of body with the tiny waist, huge ass, you know, toned and whatever. And it's extremely damaging because as we know, in our own African context, our bodies are in various shapes and sizes. And I particularly get this a lot because the shape of my body is what a lot of people might be aspiring to right now. Yeah. And the reality of it is as much as when we are in these body positive um, conversations, it's important to note that privilege, that as much as the size of my body might not be um, sus um, uh, what's the word? It might not be acceptable so, in yeah, society. society yeah. It might. It is kind of a privilege in the sense where it is desired. It's sexualized. It's it's all of these things. So I try to tr to tread very lightly around conversations of bo body positivity because I do like to note my own privilege, like around colorism, around um, body shape, around all of those things. So even before I start to try to voice my own insecurities about my body, it's very important to not make anybody else on the outside feel like their body looks horrible. Yeah, that so makes it's, sense. So it's a matter of negotiating the privileges that we have and the spaces we all exist in, but also understanding that society has also done me badly as a black woman. Society also sees me um, as this hyper fetish fetishized, sexualized being that can't necessarily be seen as normal. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and in terms of like, I mean, you speak about insecurities. What are some of your insecurities that you face? And being on such a public space where, you know, you, on social media and people mm. constantly are, you know, talking about you or commenting, mm. you know, what, how do you work through that with everyone else? Also, you know, sort of being very hyper visual, but also at the same time, paying attention mm. to your body and, you know, trying to make you feel more insecure. I think there's almost no space for insecurity on social media. Like, there are only a couple of women that I follow who can present themselves as vulnerable, um, such as Thick Leonce, um, Yummy Hearts and Curves. There are a couple of women that I follow on social media who are strong forces in the body positivity movement, and they've done it because they're so vulnerable about their insecurities. But for people like me, who have been almost pushed into the insta baddie category, it almost is as if like you have to serve a, a, a kind of visual perfection where the ratio between your hips and your waist can be this can only be this size. You can't have cellulite, you can't have this, your underarms can't be dark. These are all things that I've um, been shamed about on my own social media. So as a result, you start to begin to edit your pictures even more to a point where there is no room for um, criticism. Mm. So it's only that self-awareness, because I went through an entire stage where, okay, someone points out my cellulite, I'll smooth it even more. Mm. Someone says, this is wrong, I'll do that. So it almost got to a point of that self-awareness where I actually stopped caring. Like I stopped caring and I would post whatever I wanted to post. Yeah. But it, it's not easy to get to that point. Yeah. So how have you worked um, through your insecurities to get to a point where you are now? Because you say it's taken you a while. Like, what, what did you do actively? I think the first one had to be the shift in my brand from um, using the body as the main um, kind of thing that pulls attention. So after I almost removed myself from just using purely my appearance, and I'm not shaming anyone that does, like, mm. not at all. But I think I had to personally work through that, like to actually bring out my intellect, actually use the Instagram platform for business, using um, the attention that I got for what I'm trying to build, 
creating that um, divergence between the body and the mind is what helped me to almost navigate this idea of you have to be perfect in every single picture that you upload. So given that and also understanding that even in the world that I work in, in the art world, you have to present yourself as beautiful. Mm. You have to be well-spoken. You have to be attractive because at the end of the day, it's a business. Mm. You have to sell and people have to be attracted and drawn to you. So it's not something that I had to completely let go because we still have to navigate those politics as women, as femme people that are in these spaces. But it did help to a certain extent where I purely focused on the brand and me as a person so i had to separate that that makes sense yeah okay and um what do you say to people who call you like a slay queen do people still use that word i mean influencer <laughs> slay queen people still do i think um i don't know i embrace every single negative kind of tag that's that's thrown at me because a lot of the time, it's just the power of words. A lot of the time, if you don't allow something to have power over you, it doesn't bother you. So terms like slay queen, and it even goes as far as calling people hoes, calling yeah. people bitches, every single word that has been used um, to insult women is, is something that I give no power to, especially the slay queen term, because it originates from a point where People are constantly trying to police women's bodies. Yeah. People are constantly trying to shame women for um, bringing themselves up in such a way that almost offends other people. So if you decide to wear your hair in a certain way, if you decide to wear your makeup in a certain way, you're perceived as, as the slay queen. Whereas if you, as the slay queen, decide, it doesn't bother me. You can very well use that term to empower you and you can embrace it. And I also find it interesting that people generally use that term for black women, but a lot of white women on these spaces are called, you know, social media entrepreneurs mm -hmm. or, you know, brand influencers. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's true. Really? And then um, I guess another point I would have is, you know, you've got a huge platform. And um, I take when someone calls you an influencer, I think it's a very serious term mm -hmm. because it means you are constantly in people's faces you know you have you have a way of um almost shifting the way people view or see things mm -hmm. um you know having such a huge platform mm -hmm. what are what's what's the message that you want people to view when you influence people on mm -hmm. your social media platforms i think beyond working with brands because i think people now have be uh, have begun to associate the term influencer to people who collaborate with brands. Yeah. When I think that isn't true. Yeah. I think a lot of the people that influence us in society are people who have forged things or pioneered things that people haven't even dared to step into. So first of all, I would love to be remembered as a trailblazer, as someone that is brave enough to do things that other people may not want to do. I would love to be remembered as someone that spits in the face of um, so-called opportunities that don't necessarily speak to my brand and who I am. So I've had cases where I'm presented with an amazing financial opportunity, but the qualities and the values that are behind that do not speak to me. So I'm very strict and I'm very deliberate about what I associate myself with, especially when it comes to women empowerment, Any anything that has um, to do with Abusing women um, in any kind of way is something that I don't associate myself with. So apart from working with brands or uh, being a face of a brand, I think the most important thing is what is your personal brand? What do you stand for? And do those brands that want to align themselves with you stand for that too? I think that's powerful. Yes. Um, and then another thing that I just want to ask, in terms of, um, I mean, I guess being in the social media space, you also have to be picky about the people that are around you. Mm. Um, how, how have you been picky about your friends? I think you get to a point where it becomes a very close-knit circle, regardless of whether your friends are big in social media or not. But there is an element of having to protect your space. So some of my friends are huge social media influencers. 
some of them are huge business women but the one thing that binds us all together is wanting to keep our lives private we all have something to lose so i can sit at a table and i can absolutely share anything that's happening in my life because i understand that these people wouldn't want to jeopardize my future because they know they have something to lose in the process as well okay that's that's very interesting and take me through the like the fly safe incident that you guys <laughs> were, were involved wow, in. Wow, the people were so tense. <laughs> yeah, because um, just to give those who don't know context, um, you know, short, long story cut short, you guys were going onto a plane and a racial incident happened uh, with one of the flight attendants where she called you guys barbaric, if I'm not mistaken. She called us animals. Animals, yes. yes. Um, and then, you know, some people were like, boycott some people were like no <laughs> because one of your I, i'm not certain if michelle is your friend or not but yeah, yeah she posted saying that um you it before and then removed the tweet saying that she was going onto the plane drunk or whatever <laughs> so people had a field day about that as well oh so gosh. um talk me through that incident so yes. um you know because we have to protect certain individuals um brands and <laughs> Yes. What not? I can't reveal too much. Okay. But the crux of the matter is we boarded the plane. Um, some details may be left out in the story okay. for the purpose of protecting yes, people. Friends, but yeah. we boarded the plane and we were sitting in a row. It was three of us and we were sitting in the plane. Um, we are drinking, eating, doing everything that people do on the plane. Um, and Apparently, we were being rowdy. Um, I beg to differ, but the flight attendant came to us and she said that we were being rowdy. And prior to that, we had ordered uh, three or four um, cans of juice. And I believe she only brought us two. So we had been trying to get her attention, yeah. um, asking for more, yeah. and she didn't bring them. And as a result of that, um, I think one of us became, you know, really upset. Okay. And then when it was time, um, and she also didn't give us our change. So it was just really like an uncomfortable situation for us to see everyone on the plane being taken care of but us. Um, and then at the end of the plane ride, as the flight was descending, uh, the flight attendants were collecting everyone's rubbish, but they just didn't collect ours. So then, you know, you have to put your tray table up. So then we just collected the rubbish and we put it on the floor so that we could put our tray table up. And then the flight attendant came back and she was like, uh, she kicked it. Firstly, she kicked the rubbish towards us and she said, we're behaving like animals, we're being hooligans. We were being rowdy, all sorts of, you know, horrible slurs towards us, especially given the context that she was of a paler hue and we were obviously yeah. not. Yeah. And to be quite honest, we were flying from George and the whole flight was very, very awkward because awkward, yeah. there were not a lot of black people on the flight. Yeah. So we took it very personally. Yeah. And, um, oh, one more thing. At the end, they asked the police to escort us outside like out of the flight wow. so there was a whole police escort situation and we spoke nicely to the policemen and we were like listen we didn't do anything wrong and they said it's okay we're escorting you guys for your own safety as well um because we understand how hectic these things can these things can get and as soon as we got off the plane um that's when some of us started taking pictures and posting it on social media and then it just basically blew up because the flight attendant caught wind of the fact that we posted her and she responded saying that we were lying, we were drunk, um, she was just behaving accordingly. Yeah. So that was the, the story. And um, are you happy with how the story has panned out or how it's been sorted out or uh, what, how do you feel? So Flysafe spoke to us in private and basically it, there was an agreement that was made and uh, it wasn't necessarily an apology, but it was a statement, a, a media statement that stated that, okay, the issue has been resolved between both parties. So there was no public apology on anyone's side. I don't have much to say about that because I wasn't too emotionally invested in it. Yeah. I just thought the social media thing was really funny because people were, people were hilarious about it. Um, so I just took it in that light. And I didn't take it done. too personally. Okay, yeah. that's cool. 
And then last question, what's kind of the message that you want to leave with everyone or what's the legacy that you want to leave in this world? I think that um, it has, a lot of people right now are associating me with the idea of bodily autonomy. And I think, for instance, one of the things that I stand for as a rape survivor is bodily, bodily autonomy because of that. So it doesn't have to be a case of um, uh, hypersexualization, but just the ability for a person who has experienced that kind of violence or that kind of exploitation trauma, yeah. and trauma to be able to own their body, to be able to feel good in their body regardless of what they've been through. So that's one thing that I'm extremely um, sensitive but yet vulnerable and open about to people that I would like to be remembered for. Okay. Um, I mean, I always like to end these off with an appreciation. So um, I really just appreciate you for um, everything that you are doing in terms of moving women forward. I know sometimes when we fight these things, you don't necessarily see the bigger picture or what yeah. it's doing for different women. But um, I can definitely tell you that, like, even just from reading some of your comments or whatever, you know, people are inspired to be a lot more positive mm. about themselves and, um, you know, really just pushing the narrative forward. So mm. continue to do that. Continue to be open and vulnerable about your scars um, and your wounds um, in a hope that one day um, black women will be fully free to embrace their bodies mm. and embrace the fact that we can be intelligent and sexy yeah. and i think you're a perfect embodiment of that yeah so thanks Thank you. okay <laughs>